Welcome, everybody, to the McKean's Hockey Podcast. Hopefully, this is not your first time listening in, but if it is, welcome. Today, we're going to be discussing our recently released mid-season 2024 NHL Draft Rankings. Now, there have been quite a few changes, some major ones, uh, that we're going to discuss today. First, we wanted to start off by just, if you haven't seen the list, telling you our top 10. So, that 10 is... Macklin Celebrini at one, Sam Dickinson at two, Ivan Demidov at three, Anton Salayev at four, Kato Lindstrom at five, Berkeley Catton at six, Artem Shunov at seven, Constant Consta Hellenius at eight, Cole Eiserman at nine, and Zane Parekh rounding things off at number 10. Now, if we look at our list the last time we released it in December when we had another podcast and we discussed it, The biggest changes inside our top 10 in terms of players moving up would be Ivan Demidov and Berkeley Catton. Now, Derek, uh, did you want to discuss maybe why those two have seen some movement up inside our top 10? Yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, Demidov came into the season as one of the more highly regarded prospects for this class. You know, a lot of people saw him as a potential top five or top three pick. But he's just in a bit of an odd circumstance. Um, he, it's, he's going through the same thing that Matt Faye Mishkov went through last year, where you know he's probably too good for the MHL level, uh, maybe not good enough for the KHL level, but also not really getting a lot of opportunity to play up at the pro level. And then he had some injury issues earlier in the season. So there was just a little bit of uncertainty going on there. But over the last little bit, Demidov has been healthy. He's been in the lineup consistently. And his performance has just been nothing short of incredible. He is putting up historic numbers in the Russian Junior League. He is averaging about two points per game right now, which is absurd. He's outscoring all of his teammates by a wide margin. And he's just pretty much unstoppable right now. And no matter what team that seems SKA goes up against, they just don't have an answer for him. He's just very electric with his puck skill. He sees the offensive zone very well. He has a great nose for the net. He's got a great killer instinct. I mean, all these things were there before, uh, including earlier in the season, but he just wasn't putting them together quite as consistently, especially bouncing up and down between levels. But just when we've seen him have a chance to, you know, settle in a little bit, get comfortable in a situation, the results have been just truly remarkable. And I really think that goes to show just how much pure offensive upside he has. And overall, he, he's not a one-dimensional player either. He can play a physical game when he needs to. I think he's quite smart off the puck. He's not a liability defensively. We're just getting to see his game really clicking. We're seeing it at a very high level. And I think that justifies bumping him up to where we have him now. Because in terms of just pure offensive upside, He's probably second in this entire draft class behind only Macklin Celebrini. I mean, he's a guy who you could conceivably see scoring 70, 80 points on a first line at the NHL level. And, you know, those kind of players are very special. Uh, With regards to Berkeley Cat, and it's a similar sort of story. He came into the year highly regarded. You know, he had a great rookie season in the WHL. He was the first overall draft pick in the WHL Banton draft. The start of the season was a little hard, not just for him, but also for his Spokane Chiefs team. You know, they didn't start strong. Uh, Everyone kind of knew they weren't going to be a contender this year, but it was really rough going for them early on. But what has been really impressive about Cadden is he just hasn't slowed down. Actually, if anything, he's picked up his game, even despite the fact that it's been obvious that his team is, you know, a long shot to go anywhere this year. Like his ability to perform night in, night out has been incredible. Um, he's putting up a ton of points despite the fact that he doesn't have a lot of support around him. He's driving play. He's effective as a goal scorer and as a playmaker. I mean, he's at 39 goals this year in 51 games, and he's doing that almost single-handedly because he doesn't have a lot of support. What I've also noticed this year, and this is actually pretty impressive, is as far as I can tell, he's leading the entire WHL in shorthanded points right now with nine. He's got six shorthanded goals, and three shorthanded assists. So he's not a one-dimensional player whatsoever. You know, he's getting the opportunity to play on on the defensive side of things as well. He's getting a lot of opportunity to play in all situations, and he just keeps getting better. And the fact that he's not being deterred 
by his situation, I think he deserves a lot of credit for. I mean, Spokane's getting blown out in a lot of these games. They're always the underdog. But Cat is just, he just keeps going to work. You know, he doesn't let the situation get to him. It doesn't let him get him down. I think that really speaks a lot to his character. And when you factor that in with his skill and with the well-rounding of his game this year, I think there's just so much to like that it really does warrant where we currently have him. Okay, and so Josh, we have two guys who have sort of slid down our list inside of our top 10 and Cole Eisenman and Michael Brancic Nygaard who has moved out of our top 10. And I know that your video team isn't um, or hasn't been the highest on them lately. Can you speak to sort of why those two are sliding down the list a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Cole Eiserman, we'll start with him. Um, we talked about him on the last podcast as well as somebody that was maybe a little bit lower than consensus ranking. And uh, for the video team, I think, especially coming into the season, there was there was pretty high expectations for what Eiserman would do with the national development team. And he, he just really hasn't taken those steps forward that we were hoping for. He's arguably the best goal scorer in this class, but the rest of his game just isn't matching what we'd like to see. Uh, he's not a play creator. Uh, you can even see that in his goals versus assists right now. Um, he's got 38 goals and only 22 assists. Um, he is more of a passenger on plays and we we're really hoping that throughout the year he would really take more of a lead uh, in creating offense in being able to find his teammates and we're just not seeing that um, his off puck play overall is just it, it just leaves leaves us wanting a little bit more um, obviously scoring goals is, is a high hot commodity in the NHL so um, he's still up high but there's just, we really wanted to see a little bit more from him. And it is possible that it still comes, but uh, he's, he's just just leaning on that goal scoring ability. Or there's just a question of how that will translate to the NHL level. If he's just a passenger, um, not sure I see top line potential in him at this point. Um, could be second line, but again, he's going to need a centerman or... Uh, another player on his line to really carry and drive and get him the puck. So you're going to need another piece to complement him. For uh, Brantag Nygaard, this was a player that we actually talked about a lot because the, the three people on the video team, we kind of had differing views on him, but ultimately we just we feel like he's a very safe pick. He's got a high floor, but we're not sure how high the ceiling is at this point. Um, the offense in the Alsvenskan in Sweden has has been better recently, but it's been a bit of a struggle. We were hoping for a little bit more from him out of this year. Don't get me wrong; he's he's honestly still one of my favorite players in this class. Um, I think his his skill set, his defensive game, his ability to um, create offense is promising. I just don't know if his uh, full potential is as high as some of the other players that we've put above him. Um, so again, I still, I still really like the player and just kind of question that upside. And, um, he's, he's still a player that is going to be attractive to a number of NHL teams. Yeah. And I totally see what you're saying about Cole Eiserman. He's somebody that we're going to talk about a little bit more later on in the podcast. As part of our mailbag section, we got a really good question about him. So we'll kind of go in a little bit deeper then. Uh, one of the bigger players in Ontario that's moved up our list is Zane Parekh. He's moved into our top 10 at the number 10 slot. Uh, we had him at 17th. Now we moved him up to 10. Uh, it, it comes down to the fact that we just can't ignore the production at this point, right? This is a player that is on a historic offensive run in the Ontario Hockey League. What he's doing offensively from the blue line this year, it's very rare. It's very rare for a draft eligible player. And I think that speaks volumes as to the creativity, the IQ, the offensive upside that Zane Parekh possesses. Now, granted, Saginaw is a team that plays a very unique style. They play a hybrid sort of style that NHL teams don't currently employ. This is a team that is sort of embracing the future of, we're, we're not going to say positionless hockey, but they do afford their players a lot of creativity. 
and they allow Perec to be very aggressive offensively. I think what has really moved him up the list for me is even though he is kind of classified as that high risk, high reward type of defender, he's so good at mitigating risk already. He is somebody who picks his spots really well. Rarely do you see him scrambling to return to the defensive zone because he's turned the puck over or made a poor pinch or made a poor read. The defensive miscues that are happening are doing or are happening inside the defensive zone already. Um, they're from a lack of strength, uh, a lack of engagement. They're from those types of things. They're not from him turning the puck over in the neutral zone, in the offensive zone. He's he's so careful. He, he mitigates risk so well. And I, I think that does, it has sort of clarified for us uh, as a team that there is a better likelihood that he reaches that offensive upside, that he's going to be more of, uh, I'm not going to say a, a clone of an Eric Carlson type, but that he does have that upside and maybe a little less risk, like you know when Ryan Merkley was drafted, for example. That's a name that gets thrown around a lot when people are sort of comparing the downside to Perek. So he's somebody that we've moved up uh, just based on the fact that we simply can't ignore what he's doing this year any longer. Um, now, when we look at the list, there have been some other players who've risen significantly into our first round range. And um, one of the guys is somebody that I've been really impressed with this year. Uh, when I've seen them internationally, I think he's been maybe Sweden's best and most consistent defenseman as part of the U18 program. And I know Josh, uh, the video team has been very high on him pretty much all year, I, I believe. And that's Alphonse Fry. Uh, can you speak to why he's somebody that's that's really moving up lists right now? Yeah, absolutely. He's just, at this point in the year, he's a player we can't ignore. Uh, he's such a fluid skater. He's so light on his feet. Uh, he's so hard to pin down just because of his creativity, his elusiveness, his unpredictability. Um, he really leans into that role as the modern defenseman. Um, he has great vision. So in the offensive zone, he's constantly finding his teammates through traffic. He's moving the puck around. He's pulling people out of position. And he does have really sharp decision-making of when to activate, when to hold back, uh, when to to jump in the rush. Um, the guy, I, I, I always see his intelligence throughout the game. Um, he When he's leading the rush from his own end, he, he really knows when to try and feed it to somebody else or when to carry it himself. In the offensive zone, he seems to really know when to fire off a good shot, um, depending on where he is in the ice. He takes advantage of the space in front of him, um, but if he doesn't have space, he'll look to move it to a teammate. Um, he's been so strong in the J20 this year. Uh, he's nearly a point per game pace, and that carried into the recent U18 Five Nations tournament. He had seven points in four games, helping Sweden to win that tournament. Like Brock said, internationally, he's he's been arguably one of the, the best defensemen or players on the team. I will say that he does come with a bit of risk, as, as any defenseman of his style would, where he can get caught if he is trying to go too deep or carrying it too much on his own. Um, but overall, I think the reward outweighs the risk here, and uh, I would definitely bet on the reward. Um, I, I think he's on his way to developing into a top four NHL defenseman. Um, and could be a power play quarterback. There's there's just so much to like with him. So let me ask both of you this question then, since I've already said that he's somebody that I really like. Do you think that there's a chance that Fry can have that move, that very, very steady move up the rankings like Tom Villander did last year and push into that upper echelon of defensemen? Can he get into that Carter Yakumchuk? Uh, Zane Parag, Z Byam, can he get into that group with maybe a really good U18s to cap off the draft year? I do think so. I think he's right on the edge, and I know we have uh, we have Adam Yurisek just ahead of him. I think he could get just above that. I'm not sure if he's at a at a Zev or a, a Yakumchuk level yet, but like you said, a big U18s could really change that. I think um, he's for me. He's the top defender out of Sweden. Um, and I think he's right on the cusp of joining that upper echelon group. I, I certainly think that it's possible. I mean, he's certainly in a good position to keep elevating his game throughout the season. I mean, we're going to see him at the U18s. 
he's going to be getting a lot more ice time with his club. Um, I, I have a hard time seeing him reach the yak and chuck and booyam kind of level personally. I think he's good. I just don't know if he's going to be as good or show as much as those other two already have comparatively. But when it comes to the draft, I mean, teams always put a priority on defensemen. Um, if a team is close between Fry and maybe someone like a uh, Brandsig Nygaard or maybe someone like Neil Hemming, I mean, I could very easily see an NHL team picking the defenseman over a winger or, or a center. So it's certainly possible. Uh, but I would say that a, a big U 18s is going to be a prerequisite for him there. It's going to be a great opportunity for him to really show himself again. And I think that will play a lot into where he ends up getting picked. Now, speaking of defensemen, especially athletic defensemen. There are two that have moved pretty far up our list uh, for this midseason ranking. And, and Derek, I was hoping that you could speak to those two players. Uh, so yeah, the two are Harrison Brunicki, uh from the Kamloops Blazers in the WHL and Don Bedinka from Malmo in Sweden. And these two are actually very, very similar in their strengths, their weaknesses, their impact. And, and I'll go over both um, individually. Uh, they're both um, really athletic, rangy kind of defensemen. So they're both about 6'2", 6'3", with very, very high-end skating ability. And they're more defense-first defensemen overall, more puck movers as opposed to pure offensive guys, but their offensive games are starting to come along as well. And both of these guys are just on a very good trajectory. They're making a lot of progress and they're making it quickly, which is always something you want to see out of a player in their draft year. You don't want to see guys kind of stagnating or hitting their ceilings a little too early. You want to see guys that are growing, but still show a lot of room for growth. So with Bruno Keefe, First, first and foremost, um, he was part of the Kamloops team last year that played in the Memorial Cup. And he was a depth piece on that team, you know, on the third pair primarily. But he was around guys like Logan Stankoven and Olin Zellweger and Fraser Mint. And you can see that a lot of their skill and knowledge has rubbed off on him because we, we've seen him take a huge step this season compared to last year. And even throughout the year, he just seems to get better month over month. You know, there was a lot of opportunity on Kamloops this year for guys to step up because they're a rebuilding club now. You know, all their big stars from last year are gone. And Brunicki has taken a huge step forward and really assumed, like, the mantle as the number one defenseman on that team. He's playing a lot of minutes in all situations. He's looking good on the power play. He's looking very good on the penalty kill. And he's been great just as an all situations, even strength defenseman. I mean, he's really moving the puck well. He's great on breakouts. He's great in transition. He's dangerous when he joins the rush. And he's gaining a lot of confidence, too. He's taking the puck from the blue line in. He's trying to make more plays with it himself. He's just really growing his game in, in a way that's incredible, I think. Um, he's getting a lot of ice time in Kamloops, and that's going to be the case over the next two seasons as well. He's probably going to stay as their number one defenseman. So he's in a great situation to keep that progress going. And Kamloops is a good organization. They've developed a lot of NHL talent. They're one of the stronger organizations in the WHL as a whole. So I would say that his development is in very good hands. Uh, with Badinka, he, he's kind of an interesting case. He's, he's from Czechia and he's played for them internationally. But last year he played in the U20 league in Finland with Jokerit. This year, he actually went over to Sweden and is now playing for Malmo. And like Brunicki, he's a defenseman who really, his game is really built through his skating ability. He's got these long, fluid strides. And I would say he's actually a little more explosive than Brunicki is. Just watching him really move out on the ice when he's got some room to operate is very, very impressive. He can just blow by defense or blow by opponents. Um, he's great on the breakouts. He gaps really well. He defends really, really well with his feet. He's got pretty good reach with his stick as well. And when you look at his numbers from this season, he's only has three points in 28 games at the SHL level, which doesn't seem like a lot. But when you watch him play, he's creating opportunities. He's getting scoring chances for himself. He's making things happen for his linemates as well. Uh, Malmo is not a very good team this year. They're one of the worst in the SHL. So that might be playing a part. Uh, you know, he's not getting any, you know, easy secondary assists that some other defensemen in this class might be getting because they play with a lot more offensive support. 
Um, but when you just watch him, you just see his game growing really, really well um, from one month to the next. Uh, he's got a, a style and um, like a, and tools that work really, really well um, at the pro level now and should be really good tools for him at the NHL level. When you just kind of envision what he could look like at 24 or 25, you've got a defenseman who's got great speed and conditioning, who can log a lot of minutes. He can play physically uh, in his own zone. He can defend well with his feet. And he also might have some untapped offensive potential to his game as well. So yeah, things right now might be a little raw with him, but when you look at the progress that he's made and just the runway that he has left to keep progressing and developing, I think it really does warrant where we have him on our list. Yeah. Okay. So we also have one forward who's moved up our list pretty significantly and he's from my region in Ontario and that's Guelph's Jet Luchenko. He's somebody that, He's moving up our list just based off of the consistency that he's shown as one of Guelph's most improved, one of Guelph's most consistent, one of Guelph's most dangerous players this year. They lost Matt Quatra at the beginning of the year. When I say lost, he was somebody that was expected to come back to Guelph and be one of the better players in the OHL this year. Filling that hole wasn't going to be easy on that first line. And Luchenko showed that he could be a high energy guy last year in, in his rookie season. Um, but there wasn't necessarily anything that, that suggests that he could take this sort of leap this quickly. And I think it's very impressive that he's taken over that first line center role and he's really run with it. He's somebody that plays a very solid, versatile pro style game, very good skater, already a committed two way player has skill as a playmaker. A lot of his, potential is going to be tied to improving his strength and conditioning. He's somebody that is still sort of uh, inconsistent in applying his trade through the middle of the ice. Now, what I love about his game is that even though that has been inconsistent because he does get easily muscled off and, and does have trouble playing through traffic occasionally, he still tries. That effort is always there. He's still trying to make things happen through the middle. He's still getting his, well, for lack of a better term, getting his nose dirty. He's still crashing the crease. He's still working in the corners. He's still somebody who plays somewhat of a physical game, uh, very almost pest-like, even though he has this high-end skill. And I think that as he does get stronger, we're really going to see his game reach that next level. And I, I know my partner in Ontario, Chase Roshan, feels that Jet is the best forward from uh, Ontario this year. He likes him more than Green Tree or Beckett Seneca. And I, I, I'm not quite at that level yet, but he is somebody that I do really like and I do think deserves to be ranked in our first round, thus the move up. Now, we talked about the biggest risers. Now it's time to look at some, we'll call them fallers, players who've moved down our list pretty significantly. And we've identified four guys who have fallen pretty significantly from our December list, fallen even more probably significantly from our preseason list. The first one we're going to talk about is a defenseman from Finland, uh, Aaron Kitty Harju. It's been very difficult for him this year because he just hasn't really played because of injury issues. Anytime you have somebody like that, and Adam Jurczak is somebody who's going to be under the microscope over the second half of the year too because he's not playing. And it's tough, right? When other players are playing, other players are showing what they're capable of doing. It does have a negative impact on the players who aren't playing in terms of their ranking. And, and Kibi Harju is somebody who hadn't really shown a lot of progression when he did play uh, this year. And I, I think that's sort of the issue. Um, Josh, where do you think Kibi Harju ends up fitting in in the overall draft landscape? Yeah, like you said, it's just so tough with him right now because obviously coming into the season, there was a lot of hype around him. He's maybe one of the top defenders. He's been on the radar for years uh, just because of how fast he developed. And the problem with a player developing so fast and getting to that international stage so quickly is that you really start to have expectations and you really want to see it continue. Uh, because he was kind of an early bloomer, he seemed to kind of plateau a little bit to start this season. Uh, which was concerning everybody. You want to see him take those next steps forward. And then with the injury, it's less about him and more about everybody else really just kind of taking those steps and where he left off just didn't really sit well with a lot of people. 
uh, including our scouts. Like, I think we were just really hoping for him to kind of find his game this season and really take those steps forward. But because he hasn't been able to, other players have just been more impressive. And that's just really due to his sliding down the list. Uh, hopefully he can come back and kind of quickly impress and that could change things. But as of right now, it's, it's tough to see him as a first rounder at all. Um, hopefully he can kind of change that if he gets the chance, but as of right now, he's, he's definitely a contender to fall out of the first round completely. Now, Derek, I know one thing that you and I have talked about a lot is that concept of early matures versus late matures, right? And when we look at a guy like Kimi Hardshoe, one of the things that people were looking for this year out of him was improvement as a skater, right? The, especially given that he's not the biggest defenseman out there. So in order for some of those offensive gifts to translate, one thing people were really looking for this year was that improvement in his skating. And that's just something that we didn't really see early on and now don't have the ability to, to see. Do you think that has been one of the main reasons that he's sort of fallen down a lot of draft boards, not just ours? Yeah, I would agree with that. It's just anytime you're an undersized defenseman, you really need to have high-end skating ability. If you're not going to be able to make defensive stops with your strength or your reach, you need to be able to do it with your feet to keep tight gaps or just to apply the right amount of pressure on fast forwards. And we're just not really seeing that with Kiwi Haru. And I think that's a problem. Um, and you can also see that affecting his offensive game as well. You know, to, to really create on offense, whether that's from the blue line in or in transition, having light feet and a lot of agility and a lot of speed is, is very important. And we're just not seeing that out of Kibi Haru. And from what we saw earlier in the season with him, it's, it's hard to see the value he would bring at the NHL level especially because he's not making that sort of progress we wanted to see. Like I was saying with Brunicki and Badinka, you, you want guys that have runway. You want to see guys that are improving now and you can see where their game could conceivably keep improving. And with Kibihari, you are not seeing that right now. He hasn't taken a big step and he's, he's got to take more than just one uh, leap up levels too. You know, he'd probably go from Finland to the AHL and then the AHL to the NHL. So you need, to see the ability in, in these players to keep improving and to have something that they can rely on to help them make those jumps. And with Kibi Haru, I'm a little skeptical about it. Now, there are still very good things about his game. He's still very smart. His work rate is really good. He's pretty good with the puck. Um, but yeah, the, what you were saying is totally true. It's just hard to see where his game is going to go from here and which ways he can improve. He just almost seems like a player that doesn't have quite enough of an identity at the moment. And the fact that he's lost a lot of uh, game time this year due to injury really doesn't make that situation any better. Now, the next one, Derek, is somebody that's from your region. And uh, obviously, the injury issues haven't been as drastic as Kivi Harju, but I feel like Ryder Ritchie has had a tough time sort of getting into a groove this year based on a lot of things that are happening. Can you kind of speak to why he's somebody that's that's fallen down our draft board? Yeah, his situation is quite similar to Kibiharu's, where he hasn't been playing in a while, and that's hurt his stock, as others have, you know, had the chance to grow and play and answer some questions that scouts had about them. What was rough about Richie is that he wasn't playing particularly well right before he got hurt either. He was going through a bit of a cold snap, uh, he just wasn't quite looking like himself. I mean, we're talking about a guy who was the WHL Rookie of the Year last year, burst onto the scene really well, had a great showing at the Holinka Gretzky Cup, was very, very dangerous on a one-two punch with Berkeley Catton, but just hasn't really quite looked like the same player this year. Maybe he had something nagging in Prince Albert that was kind of holding him back, and you know now he's completely out. And it's it's just been really hard to see because he's a player that – at his best, really does show a lot of different things. He's a great playmaker. He's a great shooter. He's a super high work rate kind of guy. Um, there's just a lot of different things that are really good about his game. But we just haven't quite seen them as much as we'd want this year. And it also doesn't help that Prince Albert hasn't been particularly good. They're a team that's fighting for a playoff spot. They don't have a lot of talent. There were a lot of times where I watched Richie where he was 
trying to do too much because he just didn't have a lot of support. Um, I'm hoping that he's fully healthy for the U18 tournament this spring, because I think that's going to go a long, long way to showing scouts, you know, who the real Richie is. If it's the guy that we saw uh, last year or the guy that's just kind of hasn't been able to put it all together this year. Another guy that's fallen on our list is Cole Hudson. And this one wasn't necessarily an animist within our, without our scouting community in the Keens. Uh, I think probably a lot of it came from myself personally. And I think my issue with Hudson is I just don't necessarily know what he's going to be at the next level. I think we look at his brother Lane and there's that very clear path for him to be an NHL player based on his skill and creativity. With Cole, I don't think he's as skilled or as creative as Lane is. And and very few players are. Let me premise by saying that, right? We're talking about one of the more creative and skilled defenders outside of the NHL right now in Lane. He obviously has some of his own issues that he's going to have to overcome to be an NHL player. But with Cole, he's somebody that I just don't know if I've seen a ton of progression in this year in, in every category. I, I liked his game a lot. Uh, as a U-17 player and as a U-18 player, I think that there are other defensemen on that U.S. roster who've kind of overtaken him. And it kind of concerns me a bit because now I find myself wondering, you know, is Cole skilled enough to be uh, a top pairing uh, power play quarterback? Is he good enough defensively? Yes, he's got a little bit more size than Lane does, but is he good enough defensively to be somebody who could play a really solid minute eating top four role what are what are we looking at here in, in terms of Cole I do think that his play has been better lately I thought he had a pretty good five nations um, but overall I just found myself somewhat wanting more from him this year and I think given the strength of defenders available this year he's somebody that I just found when we're looking at putting together these draft rankings I find myself saying wow, I, I prefer this defenseman. I prefer this defenseman. I think this defenseman has a higher upside. And then that kind of pushes a guy like Cole a little bit further down. Um, Josh, where do you, where do you stand on, on Cole Hudson? Yeah, I agree with what you said. I think the, the video team had him a little bit higher than we ended up with him on our rankings. But if you look at his development, and of course, we're, we're not going to be able to avoid the comparisons with his brother. Um, at their age 17, um, comparing them it is when Lane really took off and really kind of exploded, especially with in, in his offensive game. Um, Cole has kind of gone the opposite way where he's actually tapering off a little bit compared to previous years. So I, it's almost like they've developed differently where Lane was that late bloomer and Cole was a little bit more early. And um, I think we're kind of seeing that there's, there's a lot of offensive potential there, I think. But they're just just like his brother. There are some questions of the the defensive game. So um, he's a, he's a guy we like, but he's he's uh, there's some question marks there for him for sure. The last one, Derek, is another one from your region. He's somebody that's been hyped for a few years now because he is a late birthday, and that's Tanner Howe. Yeah, it's it's hard with Howe because I really really like him. He's, he's a really high character guy. His work rate is awesome. You know, he's a leader. He's the captain of that Regina Pats team. And he's got a sneaky amount of skill when he gets a chance to use it. But what I'm starting to see with him this year now is that he's starting to feel a little limited in what he can do. At this level, he's already struggling a little bit with the physicality of opposing teams. He's already struggling a little bit with the speed of opposing teams. And that's not a great sign because as he goes up levels to the AHL and then to the NHL, potentially, it's only going to get stronger. It's only going to get faster. And I'm having a hard time seeing where he can add to his game in that regard. Now I actually interviewed him um, after a game, not that long ago. And when I asked him, you know, what sort of things he was focusing on, uh, improving the first thing he said was his speed and his skating which which is great I mean that's exactly the answer that I wanted him to say and it's really nice that he is recognizing that part of his game that needs to improve um, I have a hard time seeing just exactly how much progress he'll make 
which makes it a little concerning. Now, I'm not saying that he's not going to get picked at all or that he doesn't have a chance. I mean, he's still within our top 100. I think we've got him in the late second round right now. Like, he's still a guy that I could see figuring it out just because he is so smart. He's got a very mature attitude about him. Um, he can make plays in tight spaces when he gets the opportunities. I just worry a little bit about what that's going to look like at the NHL level, what his upside is. At one point, I thought he had a pretty good projection as a top six forward. Now I'm a little more concerned about where he's going to end up. And that I'm not so concerned that I wouldn't pick him at all. It's just I worry a little bit about, yeah, just how much value is going to bring in the NHL level. And I think there are a lot of other guys that are starting to emerge in this draft class that maybe project a little bit cl more cleanly as a top six forward or a top four defenseman. And those are the types of guys that are starting to pass him now on our rankings. Yes. Okay. So now let's kind of, no, we're not going to rapid fire uh, different segments at you, but we're going to move on. We're going to sort of, sort of go through uh, a little bit more quickly some other guys um, in different categories that we either like uh, or feel like have the potential to move up. So the first part we're going to talk about are some players that we feel are really knocking on the door of the first round. So they're just outside our first round, and we think that they have a chance to move up further. And I'm going to take the lead, and I'm going to throw one of the best names in the draft this year, and that is John Mustard. Now, this is a player that... I think has had a very slow bird. He's not somebody who came into the year with a lot of hype and he's had a very good USHL season. And I thought he was probably one of the largest standouts, if not the biggest standout at the all American prospect game. He's somebody whose speed is going to absolutely play at the next level. The scoring ability will play at the next level. I want to watch more to see how I think his other components are going to round into form. Uh, what's the upside in terms of his playmaking ability? What's the upside in terms of his overall complete game? How versatile of a player can he end up becoming? But he's somebody who I think is really starting to interest me as a player with speed and scoring. And um, I could see myself really advocating for him to be a first-round pick by the end of the year if he continues to play as well as he has been lately. Uh, Derek, who's your choice for this? Yeah, a guy that I've started to come on to lately, uh, a little bit late to the party perhaps, is uh, Yegor Surin uh, out of Russia. He plays for uh, the local Loco team in the uh, Russian U-20 league. And he's really interesting to me because the circumstances of his situation are maybe playing into him flying under the radar a little bit. So as I'm sure everyone already knows, we're not seeing Russia internationally right now. They're not playing at the Linka Gretzky Cup. They're not playing at the World Junior A Challenge like they have in the play have in the past. They're not playing at other tournaments. So I'm thinking that a lot of the guys from Russia maybe aren't getting as much attention as they otherwise would. And Surin is the type of guy who strikes me as someone that we probably would be talking about a lot more if we had more of an opportunity to see him internationally. He's well over a point per game um, on his team right now with 46 points in 37 games. He's a center. He's got a well, a very well-rounded uh, profile. He's a decent skater, good puck skill, a good playmaking, good shot. But something that I really love about him is he's a very physical player, and he's got a lot of very strong pest elements. So he's at 104 penalty minutes this season. And just watching him play... I wouldn't say he's like a goon necessarily where he's taking a lot of dumb penalties. What keeps happening is he'll blow a guy up with a big hit and then he'll get jumped and kind of dragged into a fight. So there's a lot of that going on as well. But I like that sort of competitiveness, right? You want to see a guy with some competitive fire as long as he's able to stay on the right side of it. And with a player like him, I think he does a good job of that. So when you've got just the overall package of a guy who's a center, uh, he's chipping an offense. He brings a physical element. He gets under guys' skin. I mean, there's a lot of good traits there to like about him. And I just can't help but feel like if he was playing, you know, in the USHL or somewhere in the CHL this year, and we're getting to see him a lot more. And I just feel like we'd have a very different opinion of him. I think he's flying under the radar. And he's definitely a guy that I want to come back to and watch a lot more because 
I think if the team does enough due diligence on him, he could be a guy that provides a sneaky amount of value uh, whenever he gets picked. Josh, you're going to keep it in Russia as well. So why don't you go with your selection? I am. Yes. Uh, I think Derek nailed it. That uh, the Russians not participating in international events um, has impacted the, the ranking of many of them publicly. Um, so I'm going to talk about Nikita Artemanov. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about Saleyev's play in the KHL this season and, and for good reason, but it has in part overshadowed the performance of Artemanov, who's on the same team. Um, he might have one of the best motors in this class. I've never seen him take a shift or even a second off. He's always full pedal to the metal. And I, I tend to love those players who just have that high level of competitiveness. Um, he's played 50 games in the KHL this season, putting up 22 points. So that's the most of any draft eligible in the league this year, including guys like uh, Chernisov and Shervin, who have been getting some, some first round love. Um, Artemanov has spent time on the first line this season as an 18 year old in the KHL. Um, granted, that's been a little bit hit and miss throughout the year. Some days, some games he's on the top, some he kind of shifts a little bit down. But when he's playing on the top line, he's often looking like the best player on that line, the driving force, uh, which is just really impressive. His positioning really stands out, um, and especially at the level of play in the KHL. He's extremely intelligent, both ends of the ice, and he really balances that skill and competitiveness. Um, I think he is a guy that we shouldn't be surprised if we hear him called in the first round. Um, just the fact that he never gives up on a play, I think you should always bet on those players because even if they they do lack some some skill, which I don't think Erdoganov does, um, their drive will kind of carry them to next levels. But uh, he's he's definitely a guy that I think think will likely be in our first round before the draft. Okay, the next segment is looking at players that we personally wanted to squeeze inside of the first two rounds, but we're just ranked outside of it. So Josh, why don't we go back to you for your selection for this one? Yeah, for sure. So we'll go over to Finland this time for uh, VT Weissenen. Um, I know we dropped him from the bottom of the first round to the top of the third round. So he's 69th overall now. I personally think it might have been a bit too far uh, as I've gone back and reviewed since we finalized. He's steadily increased his time on ice throughout the season in the Liga, um, and he looks like a steady, reliable D-man who I think will end up leaning a little bit more towards the defensive side of the puck. Um, I think the reason we really dropped him so far was the offensive ceiling is is likely pretty limited, um, and there's always some question of... of um, defenders lacking offense and how that translates but he is playing in the Liga so that is I would say a little bit less of a concern um, but at the U20 level he hasn't really stepped up his offensive production either so the offensive presence overall does seem a little bit capped but I do think his ability to close the gap his ability to shut down plays um, whether at the U20 level or in the Liga has been such a strong asset He's such an impressive skater, and the physicality he brings is, is strong. Um, so I think he has enough talent to to really bet on as a second round pick. Probably, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see him slide a little bit due to that offensive upside. But nine points in the Liga for a draft eligible defenseman isn't terrible. So I do think he's he's top one hundred for sure. Um, I would personally probably have him in the second round though. Now, Derek. Your two selections for this category are both from the queue. So why don't you talk to those, talk about those two? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so the first guy is Spencer Gill with the Ramuski Oceanic. And he's just a guy that I think has a lot of different things going for him. He's a big defenseman at six foot four. He's a right shooting defenseman, which obviously adds a little bit of extra value. Uh, he's a good skater with a lot of fluidity and lateral movement to his game. He's not necessarily a burner, but he gets around the ice quite easily. And the offensive side of his game is starting to come as well. He's up to 33 points in 51 games, none of those being goals. He's getting more and more ice time on the power play for Ramuski. And I just like the situation he's in. I mean, Ramuski's a good organization in the queue. They've got a good track record of developing talent. And there are a lot of good players on that team that are his age. You know, guys like Quinn Kennedy, 
uh, Dominique Pillow. And these are guys that are also 2006 birthdays. Uh, Alexander Blay is uh, 2005. He's their leading scorer. They're a team that's made a lot of good, big strides this year. I think they're going to be one of the best teams in the QMJHL next year and the year after that. So what I'm seeing is a guy who's going to be on a good team, surrounded by good players. He's probably going to get time uh, in the playoffs, maybe winning a few rounds, maybe pushing for a championship. And that's good experience. Like That's valuable for young players to get. Now, his game right now is still pretty raw. Uh, sometimes he makes some very bizarre decisions uh, defending. He seems to lose track of the play at times maybe is uh, tracking it a little bit behind um, everyone else. But you see him growing. You see the gears turning in his head. You see him picking things up um, better than he did before. So I just think that he's making progress in the right directions. And I could see him being a guy who continues to do that. Uh, the other guy is Eric Smateko, who is a Latvian forward who is playing for the St. John Sea Dogs. And I think he's been under the radar a little bit this year because St. John hasn't been very good. Um, he did get to play at the World Juniors for Latvia, but they also weren't very good. I don't think it was a great showing for him. He, he, but he's just a guy that has a lot of really good tools. He's about six foot four and a very, very good skater for his size. He has a lot of speed, um, a lot of agility. He can be very, very explosive at times. Um, he can play a physical game when he wants to. And I think he's pretty good at the puck. He's a good finisher. Now my two selections, uh, I guess are sort of similar players, but also somewhat different. The first one is Sam O'Reilly from the London Knights. I just have so much faith in the London development model. And I look at him as somebody who's been brought along slowly. He played uh, mostly tier two hockey last year um, and was even brought along slowly this year in London and has worked his way up the lineup. And he's now one of uh, Dale Hunter's most reliable players. He's somebody who sees action in all different responsibilities. He's somebody who plays a lot. He's somebody who has played both center and the wing. Uh, he's excelled actually down the middle lately. He's a very physical player, very hard nosed in that regard. He's very difficult to match up against. The skating isn't terrific. And that's sort of why I didn't advocate for him to be inside of our first two rounds at this point. I know he does have his fans inside the scouting community because he does play that very pro style heavy game. Um, I just wish that the explosiveness and overall mobility package was a little bit better, but there are so many things to like about the IQ, the physicality, the improving overall skill package and confidence with the puck. He's somebody that I think the hunters can really work with and I think can make a really solid middle six pro out of. Um, the second one is Jack Berglund out of Sweden. He's somebody that I really came to appreciate after watching the World Junior Eight Challenge. He played sort of a, a lesser role at that event, but did a lot with limited ice time. And then recently at the Five Nations, we kind of saw something similar where he did Received a ton of ice time, was in the bottom two lines as part of that Swedish under-18 team, but was a pretty consistent impact player. And, and like Sam O'Reilly, he is a physical player. He is somebody who can play both ends and projects as a solid two-way pro at the North American or on North American ice. He's got a little bit more size than Sam does. Uh, I think that there's a lot more to work with physically. I think he's a little bit better skater, a little bit more... Uh, a little bit better physical tools and a little bit more physical potential than Sam possesses. I think that he's somebody that we're really going to have to monitor closely. I think that he's earned enough or he's shown enough to earn more ice time uh, heading into the U 18s where truthfully, in my opinion, I would say Sweden's best players uh, internationally or best. Let me rephrase that. Sweden's best forwards internationally at the U18 level this year have been 17 year olds. We look at the most recent five nations where Anton Frandell uh, was probably their most consistent forward. And I think that there's, there's a lot available in terms of ice time for guys like Berlin to move up based on their performance with limited ice time at other events this year. And I think that if he can have another really solid uh, showing internationally, as well as continue to progress back home in Sweden, Plus, he's got some good 
uh, bloodlines with his father being former NHL or Christian. I think there's a lot to play with that. Uh, and I think he's somebody that I'm probably going to advocate to have higher on our next list. Now, next, we're going to talk about some honorable mentions. So these are players that were just outside of our top 100, but we personally felt that they could have been inside the top 100. Uh, Derek, why don't you go first with a double re-entry player? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So the guy I would want to talk about here is uh, Kenta Isogai who is a Japanese born and raised uh, prospect. Now he's been in uh, North America for a few years now. Uh, he played with the Youngstown Phantoms for the three years prior to this one and actually was part of their USHL championship team last year. Uh, this year he made the jump over to the WHL, joining the brand new franchise uh, Wenatchee Wild. And that has really opened my eyes to what he brings. Uh, earlier on this season, he was incredibly dynamic playing alongside uh, Matt Savoy and Connor Geeky, but he's managed to keep his play up really, really well, even after those two guys were traded away. He is by far and away their best player, and frankly, he's been one of the best players in the entire WHL this year. He is super, super dynamic with the puck. He's so creative. He sees the offensive zone so well. Um, he, he says good control with the puck. He makes it plays at a high rate. Uh, he's a pretty good finisher as well, almost like a sneaky good finisher at times. He's at 74 points this season in 51 games, but only 17 points of those have come with the man advantage. So he's scoring a ton at even strength, and he's doing it now without a lot of support around him. He's also a guy that they use on the penalty kill, and he looks really good on the penalty kill as well. He's got four shorthanded points this season. There's just a lot to like about him, and I can sort of understand why he wasn't picked in the last two two drafts. He's maybe not the best of skaters. He's agile. He can be shifty and elusive, but he's not a real burner, and he's not particularly big. He has trouble sometimes fighting through checks. But just seeing like how seamlessly he's been able to jump into the WHL, a league he's never played in before, and just kind of emerge as one of the best players in the league this season has been very, very rare, very incredible. And I think when you just look at, you know, where he comes from, his history, the fact that he's been able to make a lot of progress. I mean, I think there's, there's something special about him. You know, he's not like a guy who was, you know, born and raised in Toronto or Calgary and has been playing around just elite talents, you know, his entire life. You know, this is something that kind of came later to him. But just seeing the progress that he's able to make um, when he has been exposed to elite talent and elite systems and it, it just, I, I really like what he brings. He's, he's got a lot of pure offensive upside and, you know, maybe he doesn't quite, you know, translate that game to the pro level. There's certainly some risk to him, but when I watch him dance with the puck, when I watch the way he thinks in the offensive zone, the way he's able to create quality high danger chances out of nothing, I can't help but think of him as a guy that I would really want to take a chance on as a development project if I was with an NHL team, because there's something there about him. He, he has attributes that other talented players just don't have. And I'd love to be able to see what an NHL team could do to get the most out of his game. Josh, your pick is actually in a similar sort of position, being a second time reentry out of the WHL. He is, yeah. And uh, first off, Derek, I'll, I'll just say that I love, I love your pick, and I'm, I'm sure you'll have some thoughts on this one with Andre Becker. Uh, the Czech forward was passed over in the 2022 draft when he was playing in the the Czech U20 league, and then came over to the WHL with the Prince George Cougars last year. Had a good rookie year, um, but this year I just, I just don't think he can be ignored. He's really exploded. He's taken a step forward. Um, he was a driving force to help the Czechs win bronze medal at the World Juniors, and he's been one of the top players for the Cougars this season. I do think it's important to take all of these overagers, double overagers, double take their age into consideration. Um, Becker's turning 20 on, on February 22nd, so just in a few days uh, after we're recording this. So the performance that he's displayed in the WHL and at the World Juniors is, is really to be expected, um, but I still think he's a guy that I would have just within my 
my top 100. He he shows up clutch when the team really needs it, when the game's on the line. Um, like I said, that bronze medal for the Czechs, he was a part of that, that comeback. Um, his ability to create opportunities for other players, especially when the game's on the line. Like, hey, I just keep coming back to that. If you need a win, he's a guy you want to have on the ice. And I think teams will be really drawn to that. Um, he obviously has strong offensive instincts and has been on display this season, but he's almost just as strong at his own end. He's dependable if he's in any situation, up and down the lineup, and I think coaches will love that. Um, I, he, because of his age especially, I think he could slide out of the top 100 on draft day, but right now he's pretty solidly in my top 100. Yeah, I, I really support uh, you naming Becker here. He's a guy that's impressed me a lot uh, throughout this season. You know, the offense is there for sure. Uh, but yeah, he's he's a great defensive player too, and he and he plays center. You know, he takes a lot of big defensive zone draws for uh, Prince George. He's on their penalty kill a lot, and he just always seems to be effective. And you know, Prince George does have a good team this year. There's a lot of talent there, but he's not a passenger. I've watched a lot of games where he was the guy driving the bus for that team. He was the one making the most difference. And with uh, with both him and Isogai, and just speaking more generally about some of these um, undrafted, overage guys, I really think we can't discount the impacts of the pandemic that these players just went through. I mean, a lot of these guys really had uh, disruptions to their development at very key times. So I think some of these guys might have, you know, maybe not looked their best in their draft year or their year after, but it it almost hid what they could really bring. Maybe it hit their talent or their upside. So I'm, I'm certainly more willing to lean into some of these undrafted overagers this year compared to your average draft, just because I think we need to give them a little bit more leeway uh, and really take into account the fact that their development was disrupted quite a lot by the pandemic. I hate to spoil the re-entry party, but my two choices, and I'm going to be very quick with my two choices, are not re-entry guys, but both of them play on the same team. They're both Sudbury Wolves. They both are very different players, too. They actually could not be any more different, and that would be Nathan Villeneuve and Kieran Walton. And with Villeneuve, we're looking at, in my opinion, a a really solid potential bottom six uh, center at the NHL level uh, if he hits properly. I think the skating is good, not amazing, but I love the effort away from the puck. I love the physical engagement level. I think that there is upside offensively to become a really solid offensive player at the junior level. I don't necessarily believe that he is the most creative player, uh, the most skilled player, and I think that's going to limit his ceiling as an NHL player, but I do see, see him as somebody who can play. I think, you know, a guy like, Scott Lawton maybe comes to mind, that type of player at the NHL level, which has a ton of value when you're looking in that second and third round range. Uh, whereas Kieran Walton is a very raw player. He, he's somebody who is a very big forward, um, still sort of growing into his frame, learning to play a little bit more consistently, but he flashes some really good high-end offensive upside. Uh, Recently had a hat-trick as of uh, us recording this on Saturday morning, and one of those included an end-to-end rush. He's somebody who shows these flashes of brilliance, but in between those flashes are massive bouts of inconsistency, inconsistency, especially as a complete player. And this is kind of going back to, excuse me, his time as a minor hockey player where I was following a little bit uh, heading into his OHL draft year where I had a few scouts tell me from the OHL, this guy is the biggest boom or bust pick in the OHL draft this year. He ended up falling in the OHL draft because teams were just not willing to take that risk on him sort of figuring things out. Sudbury ultimately did, and they're looking really strong for, for taking that chance on him because he's really developing into a quality offensive player. And I think that the upside there is pretty strong. It, it just, it, it's hard though, because it depends on what night you see him. That's ultimately why he was kind of kept outside of our top 100. But if he can c- continue to string together some really strong performances and have a really solid playoff run with Sudbury, I think that would also go a really long way. Um, I think he will easily find his way into our final top 100. So we want to end this segment off with 
some questions from social media we had put out to our fans on social media that we were accepting questions for our mailbag segment for this recording. Now, we didn't get the kind of reception that we wanted, but we did get to, in my opinion, really good questions. The first one, um, I think we're going to split into two. So the first part of that question is, why so high on Sam Dickinson? And I want to throw that question over to Derek. Now, even though Sam is in my region, I actually would have had him a little bit lower. And Derek and I ended up talking about Sam for quite some time uh, as part of our meeting to put together the final touches on this list. And Derek raised some some really good points uh, about Sam. And I, I would love for you to be able to hear those points as listeners. Sure. Yeah. And I'm more than happy to talk about Sam here. So with, with Dickinson, there's a lot to like about his game. Um, he's a very, very high end skater, a uh, very impressive athlete, a uh, very well-rounded package. You know, he's, he's good at moving the puck. Um, I think he understands the defensive zone and his assignments quite well. He's able to bring a little bit of offense, primarily off the rush. He's got a big shot from the points. There are some questions right now about his decision-making and his awareness but what, but I think people need to really remember about Dickinson and about scouting in general is that you're not just evaluating the player now. You're trying to project what they're going to look like in the future as they develop and get access to more development resources, whether at the junior level or from their NHL clubs. And with Dickinson, I, I just love the situation that he's in. So, Brock, you were talking earlier about the London Knights and their development model. And Dickinson plays for London now. He's getting a lot of ice time on that team. He's playing top four minutes. And he's going to keep getting a lot of ice time over the next two seasons. So, London right now, they're one of the best teams in the OHL. They're probably going to push for a deep playoff run this year. And they're also probably going to do that the next two years as well. Because you've got guys like Easton Cowan. Denver Barkey, Oliver Bonk, like these are very good players and they're all going to be back next year. So I think Dickinson's going to have the advantage of getting a lot of playoff experience. And I think that's going to be very, very beneficial for him. Um, I also think he's going to get a lot of looks with Hockey Canada at the World Juniors over the next two years. So he's going to get more opportunity to play on a big stage, kind of develop the ability to handle pressure and spotlights and get access to more very, very good development resources. And when you look at the track record of London, not just the developing prospects in general, but also developing defensemen. You know, you've got Evan Bouchard, Logan Mayu, uh, um, Bonk, like I just mentioned. Like, these are all good defensemen that have come up through the London system. I just think he's in a very, very good situation where even though there are parts of his game right now that need to be worked on. You can say the same thing about all of the prospects, maybe not Celebrini, but pretty much everyone in this draft class has things that they need to work on, need to develop. And I just really like the situation that Dickinson is in to have those things worked on and to have his game grow and be refined and to have the assistance that he needs to take those next big steps as a prospect. I think the one thing that needs to be said about Sam is when we compare him to this glut of players in that sort of two through nine range, which I think are pretty interchangeable, I think he's the safest bet to be an impact player. Now, I don't necessarily know if I see as high an impact a player as you do with Sam, but I do see him being a safe bet to be at least a quality number three, you can play, you know, 21, 22 minutes a night in all situations. And when you look at some of the other guys in that range, you know, even looking at a guy like Anton Salaya, right, who definitely has upside, but that downside, I don't think is going to put him in that range. That downside might keep him in the KHL. It might make him more of a Dmitry Kulikov who plays in that sort of third pairing role uh, in his career over time. Um, and I think that that ultimately makes Sam very valuable. I think that the safeness of him having that ceiling makes him somebody worth ranking pretty highly. And I think that ultimately is why we had him ranked 
maybe higher than some of our competitors do um, currently. The second part of that question that we received was, why so low on Chernyshov? And Derek, I'm going to throw this one to you uh, uh, again, because I know that in our discussions, you were kind of wishy-washy, for lack of a better term, on, on Igor Chernyshov. Yeah, he, he's just a player that I, I seem to be an outlier on in terms of analysis. I've seen him in other lists as well, uh, you know, projected as a first rounder. I don't personally see that out of him. I mean, there's certainly good traits to his game. You know, he's he's strong on pucks. Uh, he's got pretty good hands. Um, you know, he's he can be very dangerous around the net. I just don't know what I see as a long term NHL player. I mean, he's contributing some points now uh, has been a decent producer at the MHL level in prior years as well. I just don't know if I see like a true top six forward there. And I also don't know if I see enough in his game to make me feel comfortable about him as a well-rounded guy. Like there are players this year in this draft class that I really like, even though I don't think they have a lot of offensive upside because I can kind of see them being really solid, really reliable bottom six forwards, guys who can, you know, kill penalties, guys who can handle tough matchups, guys who are going to be consistent game in and game out. And I don't really see that with Chernyshev. I, I struggle to see high end offensive upside. I find his game pretty inconsistent. I don't like his skating ability that much. I don't think he's particularly quick or agile. I mean, when he gets a, a head of steam going, he can create a little bit of separation for himself. But when I just see him, I see a guy who I would say has a decent floor. I mean, he's already playing in the KHL, which is obviously a really good sign. It's just I worry about the ceiling there. He reminds me a little bit of guys that we've seen get picked kind of high in the past, like a, like a Christian Fisher or maybe like a Nathan Bastion. You know, these guys that are good at – the, at lower levels uh, coming up because they're big and they're strong and they can hang on to pucks and they're hard to defend against, but maybe just don't have the standout skill that allows them to be really big impact players at the NHL level with Bastion and Fisher, you know, the guys are in the NHL right now and, you know, all, all due respect to them, but you know, they're not guys that you really would consider strong core players on their team right now. And, it's kind of where I see things with Chernyshev. I mean, maybe he'll surprise me. Maybe he'll add more like pure offensive upside to his game. Uh, maybe I just haven't caught him on the right viewings. But when I've watched him, I just haven't seen a lot that would make me want to take him in the first round, especially comparison to in comparison to a lot of the other guys who are available as well. Josh, what are your thoughts on Chernyshev? Yeah, I actually completely agree with Derek. I know when the video team was putting together uh, kind of our ranking, we he was a guy that we just kept moving down um, just because we like what other players bring more than Turner Shop. I think Derek nailed it in that I don't see that skill, that one kind of high-end elite skill that's going to carry into the next levels. I think I think he's a good player. I think there are there are traits to his game. I think there is a little bit of offensive ability there um, with the, with his puck handling, especially. I think I, I do see some potential there, but there isn't really anything that I would see as really above average. I think he, especially because he's in the KHL, because he is playing well there, I think there is a path to the NHL, but I do see a lot of talk about him potentially being a top six player, and I'm not I agree with Derek that I don't think I see that. I think he's a good, fairly well-rounded player, but there's nothing that screams high-end skill to me. One other thing that I would like to add about that is that I think sometimes we can fall into the trap of maybe overrating players in Europe sometimes just because they are playing at high levels. Now, it's it's impressive to be a teenager and playing in the KHL or the – Finnish league or the SHL or what have you, but I don't always know if that's the best thing for their development. So you look at right now, uh, Ivan Demidov and Chernyshev are the same age, 
Uh, I don't think Chernyshov has made a lot of progress in his game playing limited minutes in the KHL. Whereas Demidov, I think he's really starting to soar at the MHL level. So it, when it comes to long-term project, projection, yeah, it's, it's impressive that Chernyshov's in the KHL now, but I don't know if his game is evolving at the ways that I would want to see because he's not getting those opportunities right now. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's a very valid point, Derek. I do think that sometimes it is hard to compare players within a draft class when you have some that are playing professionally and some that are not. You have some players that are playing high school hockey in Minnesota and you're trying to compare them to playing 18, 20 minutes a night in a professional league in Europe. And, and, and that's why scouting isn't an exact science, right? And we, we try our best to, to look at what that player ultimately projects to be and not what we're currently seeing. And I think that's ultimately what is really important. Now, our next question we kind of alluded to earlier, uh, it's about Cole Eiserman. And the question was, how concerning is the perception that Cole Eiserman has a poor motor? Now, I think that that perception has really negatively impacted Eiserman's draft ranking. Uh, I think that when we look at him and the overall player that he is, the scoring ability has always been there. It was there last year. He was already a really, really good goal scorer last year. And the hope was this year that we would see his game round out other elements, right? We would see him creating his more his own scoring chances more consistently. We would see the off puck play improve. We would see some physicality. We would see the skating improve. We would see all of those things improve and reach another level. And then he could be a guy that could push Macklin Celebrini for first overall. That was sort of the talk at this time last year, right? Who's going to be that number one overall pick in 2024? You know, we were talking about Celebrini. We were talking about Cole Eisenman. And now we're talking about Cole Eisenman possibly falling out of the top 10. And that's because his game has plateaued a little bit. Now, let me preface that by saying I actually really, really liked his play at the Five Nations. And I really liked his play at the All-American Prospect game. I think we saw him finally come out of his shell a little bit at both of those events. We saw him playing physical. He was aggressive on the forecheck. He was after it in puck pursuit. We saw him creating his own scoring chances in transition. We, we saw him playing with pace that I haven't really seen him play with this year. If he could continue to do that over the course of the rest of the season and at the U18s, I'm going to have way less concerns about Cole Eisenman. If that level of play is not an anomaly and we're finally seeing the light bulb turn on for him where he's saying like i can't just be a secondary piece i am too good to be content to be a secondary piece i can be that guy who drives play and i think that's what we saw at those two events and if that light bulb has gone on i think i will probably push to have him move back up our list inside our top 10, but it's way too early to say that the light bulb has gone on. If that, if that makes sense to anybody, anybody else. Yeah, for sure. And I was, I was just going to add that um, I think he's a player that was so reliant on his skill. He had so much skill so early that he's just become a little bit dependent on it. He knows that if he gets the puck, he can likely score. And Brock, I think, I think you're right that we have seen flashes of him. When he wants to, he can go into the corners. He can get the puck. He can drive plays. It's just not consistent because I feel like he doesn't think he has to. He's still going to put up goals. Um, the same with his defensive coverage, defensive presence, defensive competitiveness. He just, I, I get the feeling that sometimes he just doesn't think he has to because, you know what, he's still going to put up points. He's still going to uh, score when he needs to. So it's really going to become a question of can he be more consistent in that competitiveness? Can he um, grow and adapt the rest of his game? And so far this season, we just haven't seen it. But you're, you're right, like seeing how he finishes the year, seeing the U18s, that could really change things. What you guys were discussing is something we have seen with other prospects before. Guys who come up the, the ranks and have a really elite skill 
that they rely on almost too much. You know, it just becomes too easy for them to rely on that one thing, whether that's a big shot or, you know, really, really good hands or really, really good skating ability. A guy who comes to mind, I think you mentioned earlier, Brock, is, is Ryan Murphy, the defenseman who came up through the OHL, was just a great skater and could always get by using only his skating ability. But as he went up levels and turned pro, he just never rounded out his game. He became like a one-trick pony, and that became really limiting for him. And that's my worry with Eiserman as well is that, you know, because he's been able to kind of score from anywhere and score at will, he almost became too dependent on that shot. Uh, so it, it really will be important to see how much he can round out his game uh, from here moving forward. And it's, it's encouraging to see that he's starting to figure that out a little bit. Okay, so let me end off the podcast with a question. Then. And in regards to Cole Eiserman, let's say that the U18's Cole Eiserman is the leading scorer of the event and shows that physicality consistently that he did at the most recent events. And he, he puts on uh, an Alex Ovenchkin like performance. Are you willing to move him all the way back up into sort of that number two, number three, number four spot? Or, you know, are those consistency issues still going to linger in your mind enough where you're saying, this is kind of where I see Eisenman in the back half of that top 10? I think. It's tough. I don't know if I would put him as high as two again, um, but I could see him sliding into maybe the, the four or five range. Yes. Uh, I think there is that question. I don't think he's going to be able to avoid that at this point, but a, a big U18, the big finish to the year. Yeah. He could go back up. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, but it also would depend on what other players do as well. You know, like we haven't seen Caden Lindstrom in a while because of injury, but he was someone who was on a very steep upward trajectory before he got hurt. Um, maybe Sam Dickinson helps lead London all the way to an OHL championship and puts up a point per game in the playoffs and really does solidify himself as the number two prospect. So it's not just going to be on Eiserman. It's going to also be dependent on what other players do as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm totally open to... Iserman moving up if he can really prove himself down the stretch because goal scoring is always at a premium in, in the NHL level. He's probably the best pure goal scorer in this class. So if you've got a guy who has that elite shot, but also has a lot of other elements that have been added to his game, I mean, that's a very hard player to not pick top five or top three. All right. Well, that wraps up things for today. Thank you for listening and then joining us on this podcast discussing our midterm rankings. If you haven't seen the list, please head on over to McKean's Hockey where you can see our top 32 for free and our top 100 only for subscribers. Also, please make sure to subscribe to our new YouTube channel where you can find this podcast and, and help our channel grow. We plan to produce a lot of content on this channel moving forward, so you can look forward to that leading up to the draft. Hope everybody has a great rest of your family day.